my title is the uh, Transforming uh, Sufism in Modern Shia Seminary. And I'm talking about one specific author um, in recent uh, Shia, you know, Sufi Shi'i order, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Bahari, and, um, you know, his, especially his, uh, the, the way he wants to present Sufism or uh, Irfan or mysticism into Shia seminary. <clears throat> so, um, the, the Shia seminary is generally known as a religious institution with an emphasis on the teaching of the Islamic sciences and in particular Islamic law. Within this scope, the seminary aims to pro prepare jurists or mushtins, so those people who are you know, experts of uh, fiqh. Uh, especially. Um, we also know that the post Safavid inclination of Sufi, as I'm sorry, post colonization of the Shia seminaries has been officially dominated by opponents of Sufism. Yet, the rare Sufi orders that continue to, to develop their ideas and practices in those seminaries. In what follows, the Sufi chain and teachings of Sheikh Muhammad Bahari. Uh, 1849 to 1907 will be studied. Bahari was a mujtahid, high-ranking Shia cleric, and a Sufi master in the 19th century Shia seminary. He studied both in the Iran and Iraq. And we know that those both uh, Shia seminaries of Iran and Iraq were in kind of collaborations. Very little, however, is recorded about Bahari's life and books. There is no independent study about him in the Western scholarly publication yet. Uh, however, it is known that he was a disciple of Akhun Mullah Hussein Ahmad Ahmadani, 1824 to 1894. Shabandi, himself a mujtahid, philosopher, and gnostic, as we will see. So, Bahari is a student or disciple of Akhund Hamadani in Irfan, mainly. Bahari was born in Bahar, a city in the vicinity of Hamadan in the western Iran, and completed his religious studies in his hometown and in the Brugert Seminary, where he received his license in Ishtahad, independent legal, legal judgment, at the age of Two from Ayatollah Mahmoud Burujirdi, who was the uncle of the later better known Shia authority, Ayatollah Muhammad Hussein Burujirdi, um, <clears throat> who was, you know, we, we know him as a grand manager of his time between uh, 1940 to 1961. Around 1880, Bahari moved to seminary in Najaf. He moved from Iran from to Najaf in Iraq, where he became the disciple and companion of Mullah Hussein Ghali Shavandi and Hamadani. Apart from a few resources or sources, there's no clear indication of who his other masters in Najaf seminary may have been. Yet we didn't know that he attended lectures by teachers in the seminary and was known among them as a pious scholar whose main interest was practical Sufism. But we know that he was a student or disciple of Mullah Hussein Ghali Shalandi Hamadami. But, you know, um, the, the, the matter is that what about the other masters? Uh, there is no clear information about that. The last three years of um, Bahari's life coincided with Iranian constitutional revolution in 1905, to, which was happened between 1905 to 1911. Mohammed Hussein Hosseini Karabi or Mirzai Naini, very well known in Iranian constitutional revolution. Uh, he, he, and uh, a Shia authority, he uh, he actually probably, uh, I mean, we are sure, I'm sure that he knew Bahari because uh, he elogized Bahari after his death and uh, <clears throat> must, so must have seen, must have 
been in contact with Bahari. We know that uh, we know I know this or we know this because now in yellow just the, the virtual and spiritual state of Bahari uh, after his death saying that where Bahari is buried is the real town of Shah on just Bahari Arami death. So Akhul Mullah Hussain Qaliya Shamandi Hamadani called Bahari as Hakim Ashab, the voice among the companions. So these are the things that we, are, we know about Bahari. Uh, these are recorded, narrated, re-narrated. And, uh, you know, we, this shows that uh, the, the position, high position of being uh, introduces Bahari as having a high rank among um, uh, Shabandi's disciples. Further evidence of Bahari's high rank is an account narrated by Muhammad Hussein Hosseini Tehrani in his Tawhid Elmi wa Aini, where he narrates from his master Alama Taba Tabai, very well known uh, Quran exegesis, in, uh, who in turn also narrates from his master uh, Sayyid Ahmad Karbala, it says that we always were in the service of Akhul Mullah Hussein Khalil Shabandi, and he was a completely supportive of us. But as soon as Sheikh Muhammad Bahari become his disciple and a murid, he stole Akhun from us, means that Akhun paid more attention to Bahari, as he later also called him as Hakim Ashab, or the wise among my disciples. The Shia scholar and bibliographer Abu Tehrani, in his Tabaqat al-A'lam Shia, indicates and confirms that Bahari held the highest rank among the disciples of Akhun Hamadani, which says in Arabic, which means uh, he, he, he was the greatest among them. And uh, Sayyid Muhsin al-Amin al-Amili also, uh, in his Ayyan of Shia, mentions Bahari as a spiritual figure among other scholarly characteristics. So we are in page six now. Biographers often mention Bahari and Kirbalai as two brilliant um, disciples of Akhun Hamadani in line with Mirza Javad Aghamaliki Tabrizi and others. Page seven. Uh, I'm talking about now Bahari and his Sufi affiliation. Contemporary biographers uh, have been perplexed about the Sufi order to which Bahari belongs. During the later period of Safi with Iran, we know that the scholars in Shia seminary used the term Irfan or Gnosis to protect themselves from a negative impugnation by the exoteric scholars and to preserve Sufism, which faced a strong opposition in attempt to describe the uh, group of Sufi Shia scholars that Bahari belongs to, Murtala Mutahari, 1919-1979, denies their connection to any Sufi order and instead calls them, quote, scholars who were not members of any formal Sufi order and who began to show profound learning in the theoretical Irfan of Ibn Arabi such that none from amongst the Sufi order could match them. End of quote. And he also, moreover, in his Khadamat al-Mutaqabil, indicates the importance of Akhun Hamadani by referring to his years in the philosophical school of Sabzawari, Mullah Hadi Sabzawari, very well now, saying, quote, if all disciples of Sabzawari we're proud of being his student. The school of Sabzabar, the school of Sabzabari is proud of presence of such a disciples, means Akhun Mullah Hussein Shavandi Hamadani, who is who was Bahari's master. Next page. <clears throat> yeah. Um then he then points out to the Shia seminary Sufis and says, quote again. Since the 16th century, there, has been in the, there have been individuals and groups devoted to a spiritual methodology of practical irfan. Mutahari calling them both individuals and groups makes the reader confused about whether a group could you know, be an organized order or not. Moreover, he asserts that their highest or high spiritual standing with the repeated remark 
that they were not members of any of the formal Sufi orders. So, yes, next page. <clears throat> it appears that seminarians, Gnostics, these seminarians and Gnostics attempt to conceal their Sufi affiliation to protect both the continuity of the tariqa and their mystical approach in the Shia Sunni because of those oppositions. Historians and biographers almost stop discussing the origin of the Sufi order at Shushteri's mysterious master, namely Mullah Hulujula. Now I need to, to, to explain a little bit. We, uh, we are just discussing about Bahari, whose master was Hamadani, whose master was Shushteri. And when we talk about this, when we read books about this group, they say that, yes, Shushteri had a master whose name was Mullah Hulujula, and we don't know who was that. The main problem of this describing of this Shias or Urafat is that Irfan is, is, is not something that appears just on its own. I mean, you have to have masters. You have to take something from someone else. So uh, they also um, quote the masters of this order asking them, um, you know, please do not try to, you know, create a salsala or a chain for us. Tehrani, among the others, Muhammad Hussein Hussein Tehrani, in his kernel of, of the kernel, states that our tariqa is that of the Akhun Tamadani, you know, which does not end in any of these salsalas or any of these Sufi tarikas. Yes, next page. Tabatabai in... Uh, <clears throat> Tabatabari, his master Ghazi, and other followers of the same, uh, 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 and others follow the same manner in discussing their own orders. So something should be hidden. In this introduction, in his introduction to the English translation of the Lubulubu kernel of the kernel, Sayyid Hussein Nas raises the question about the source of esoteric knowledge and practices of these individuals. He mentions his conversation with Henry Corbin. According to him, Corbin believed that they did not have any spiritual teachers, while Nas correctly stated that they had. Although the followers tried to conceal a Sufi connection, as we will show here, as, as we showed here, this order belongs to the Zahabi order in the Shia Sunni, and I will discuss this shortly. Ahunullah Hussein Golisham and Diyah Hamadani, again Bahari's master, who was Bahari's master, was a Mushtahid philosopher and mystic and gnostic, or gnostic. He studied Islamic philosophy with the renowned philosopher Mullah Hadi Sabzawar in Sabzawar. Those who know about this history of Islamic philosophy know who Sabzawar is and his role. He then moved to Najaf and completed his study in Fiqh and Usul with Sheikh al Murtaba al Ansari. And then we, knew, we, we, um, we should emphasize the position of al Ansari as a great scholar of his time, I mean, still uh, influential, influential in uh, Shia uh, schools. And then he also saw what happens is that um, Hamadani goes uh, from Sabzawari uh, to uh, Ansari as well. But at the same time, what happened there? In Najaf, he was initiated into Irfan by Sayyid Ali Shushteri. He then became the spiritual master of many Shia scholars in the Najaf seminary. Tehrani, in his uh, Colonel of the Colonel, mention, mentions that his position in the seminary was such as that he inherited Sheikh Murtala and Thari's position as head of Shia community. And then, but his spiritual master, namely Sayyid Ali Shushteri, wanted him to concentrate on educating his disciples in spirituality and spirituality and divine law, law rather than acting as a mushtahid. Next page. But now we go back to find out more about, uh, uh, next slide, please. We, we, are, we are going to, you know, talk about <clears throat> the other, uh, you know, uh, sources or resources where we can find out about 
um, distance uh, where it comes from. I, I, I emphasize that we know, I, I, we are talking about the Zahabiya Sufi order in Shi's. And, but um, let, let's go back to talk about a, a, just one manuscript called Rashahat Nuriya. Uh, in manuscript of Rashahat Nuriya, written by Sayyid Hussein uh, Lahir al Islam, um, between 1858 till 1919, the scholar, the, the scholar, member of the order, and relative of Sajjuddin Kaushavid Aswali, it becomes clear he's a Sufi again himself. Uh, becomes it clear that they're talking about Sayyid Ali Shushteri and talking about him as a disciple of Sadruddin Kashif al uh, who was in turn a master of Zahabi order. This fully, along with uh, Mullah Ali Nuri, was disciple of Agha Muhammad Bidabadi. So, this Rashahat Nuriya is written something between. Uh, about early 19th century, he describes and talks about Shushteri as a disciple of uh, Kashif al who was a master of Zahabi order. Next slide as well. So, also, before Sayyid Hussein Zahir al Islam, Satruddin Kashif al in himself, in, a, in, a, in his territories, uh, namely, he indicates to these relationships. We have more, more and more, you know, uh, manuscripts or documents. Next page, yes. Bidamadi is known for being an outstanding member of the Habiya order in his time. We are talking about another member, Kashif Disfuli's master, namely Bidamadi. Um, um, this chain is also also mentioned in the book called Matalib as Sulukiya of Ayatollah Muhammad Saleh Khomeini, um, alive today, a disciple of Sayyid Hashim Haddad, and he is talking about, you know, his masters. Also, another uh, contemporary scholar, Saduki Suha, in his Tahrir Saniyat Tarikh Hukama wa Arafa. He also mentions that he tries to connect Shushtari to this fully, then to uh, Satruddin of this fully, and from him to Muhammad bid Abadi, very famous scholar in philosophy as well, and Qutbuddin Nairizi, very famous, I mean, uh, uh, in Zahabiya order as well. This lineage clearly indicates a connection to Zahabiya order, although in its own form and with uh, elite characteristics. There are some connections as well with Nematullahi a Sufi order, which we are not going to talk about. Uh, the Zahabiya chain is therefore as follows. Next slide, please. As we will see, Sheikh Muhammad Bahari, and then his master, Akhund Mullah Hussain Ghali Shawandi Hamadani, and then Sayyid Ali Shushtari, and then Sadruddin Kashif Desfuli, and then Muhammad Bid Abadi, and then Qutbuddin uh, Nairizi, and also and up to up to other masters of uh, in, in, um, uh, Zahabiya orders. Uh, you, know, you know that uh, we know that the Zahabiya order is a branch of uh, um, Kubrabiya order, uh, which is which was very famous in um, uh, Asia Minor. Now, uh, the next page, yes, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about, uh, I'm going to talk about um, Sheikh Mohammed Bahari's book, uh, mainly Tazkirat al I'm, I'm going to make it brief. I, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> uh, um, kind of uh, briefly discuss about the, my introduction. In my introduction, I was talking about the, how this book is, uh, you know, and divided into different chapters, and uh, you know how probably uh, Bahari talks in this book and uh, uh, about uh, different issues. Next slide. This is like I'm, I'm telling you that this book is describing religious rituals at first. I mean, first few chapters, but religious rituals 
in, in uh, the, the explanation is in a spiritual matter. I mean, it's a spiritual uh, method, not uh, talking about pilgrimage, but talking about the, the, you know, asrar or the secrets of pilgrimage, or the very inner meaning of those actions. <clears throat> uh, next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm skipping this next slide uh, to the page probably uh, 20 through zero. Yes, the second section of the book is the focus of the paper entitled Including Four Parts in Revealing Some Realities to Awaken the Wafer. Shamil Chahar Bash, Dar Ifshaye, Hari, Hakayik Baraye, Tanapuhe Salik. Assembles a treatise on the characteristics of real scholars, their sifati ulamai haqiqi, or haqqi, and a piece on a variety of deluded scholars, their asnafi makruri. The second section follows with Dasturul Amal, his advice to wafers. The last part in the second section is a collection of 16 letters by Bihari to his followers and disciples, one of those who ask him uh, guidance. So next slide, please. These letters uh, inform us about how Bihari devoted his life into Irfan, how tries to engage others to, you know, practically involved in Irfan, in practical purification, because he looks at Irfan as the only way to change your reality, change or purify yourself or go toward perfection. Perfection, according to him, is not something gained through reading, is gained through practice. Now, next slide, I guess. <clears throat> Uh, so, also, I'm, I'm skipping this slide and going to the next one. Mm, yes. Um, the third and the final section of the book, which is the shortest part of the Tuskera, includes three other um, treatises or rasalas, uh, treatises or rasalas by other Shia seminary scholars like uh, Bahari's master. Mullah Hussain Ali Shabandi, Bahari's friends, Akhund Ahmed Karbalai, and one from Abu Muhammad Bidabadi, which is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, according to uh, official narration, uh, having Bidabadi's letter in Bahari's book is kind of meaningless unless we know that there is a, you know, a connection between Bahari's tariqa and Bidabadi's tariqa, which is the Zahabiyya. And that's, this is another indication that. Bahari somehow, you know, connects to video body as well. But the man, uh, so let me go escape this this, this uh, slide and go to the next page. Yes, um, this the book Bahari's book Tasqirat al also was collected and published after his life by by one of his uh, disciples, namely Ismail Tabrizi or Ismail Taib. And, um, you know, he collected this book after his life. So next slide. One, one thing is also important to know that is that Bahari, the, the Sufi order that Bahari was belonged to nowadays in Shia, Shia seminary, especially in Qom, is also called as Maktab Ma 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 nafs or the school of intimate knowledge of inner self. I mean, because of the uh, attention or, you know, emphasize on knowing yourself, the inner self. Uh, but in reality, it is a continuation of Sahabi order within the Shia Um <clears throat> Also escape uh, the, the next uh, slide. Um, uh, and then we go to page uh, 28. <clears throat> One thing is important here. Bahari knows that, we know that a Bahari belongs to, you know, a practical Sufi order. But at the same time, he is in the Shia seminary and he knows that there are people who are opposing 
rigorously opposing Sufism. And he had to use a language which is not creating trouble for himself and for the tariqa and for his disciples. So he understood that in the seminary environment, if a mushtaq like him used the terminology which was used by Sufis, as others had, he would come under attack as well. Keeping this in mind gives reader gives the reader a better understanding of why he did delicately and consciously introduce a Sufi wavering in a short treatise in the second chapter on the variet varieties of looted scholars that Asnaf Makruri doing his best to avoid offending people in the seminary. So next slide. So here is the, the main point of us. In, his tr in this tr treatise, Bahari introduces the triad uh, jurisprudence, fiqh, ethics for refinement of character, tahzib akhlaq, and the oneness of God, tawhid, which was probably chosen specifically by him to replace the famous Sufi triad of Sharia, Tariqa, and Hariqa. In his writing, he targets those who spend their life and time mirrored on the official religious sciences or numerism and describes them as those who never fulfill their purpose in life, namely to adapt God, godly virtues or intimatio dei or at bi akhlaqillah. Next slide. So, because of their misunderstanding of the purpose of revelation and religion, Bahari calls those ulema or those scholars as deluded ones, magruri. magruri. He then ca categorized them into different groups and um, says that some of, the, some of the famous scholars are among the magrurin and their delusion is, a, is in part caused by their knowledge and part by their amal or practice. There are different categories of this. The first group of deluded ones, some of them are merely satisfied with the handful of disputes that helps them in conversations. They do not have any share of the real doctrine and matters that pertain, pertain to fiqh and amal. Those scholars are like a, a, a tree hanging on the air, they move in the di direction that wind blows, their status is known. And then again, next group, there are another groups that are satisfied by the language arts, grammar and literature, assuming those subjects to be introductory to the religious sciences, they base their life on them. They have absolutely no share of knowledge for which they were Created. Next slide. Uh, in another instance, he even condemns mere, just engagement in fact, just in fact, I mean, if doing nothing but fact. He says, rather than truly understanding it as a primary step for the refinement of character, with this, he reveals the very essence of his view of religious studies in the seminary. And he says, quote, there is still another group that based their life merely in fiqh or its introductory courses, such as usul fiqh. Yet, they have not recognized that fiqh is an introduction to amal or practice, and practice is an introduction to the refinement of character, or as tahrib akhlaq, and akhlaq is an initial step to tawhid, the assertion, as the assertion of God's unity. So he makes this three. Fiqh, step one, akhlaq, or ethics, step two, and tawhid, step three. Means he says that people should reach to the step three, but those who only talk about fiqh, they do not walk and go on. So there's no change in that. And then he also quote, quote, he says, 
this poor man is entangled in the introduction of the initial step. And there will be further introductory steps for him to take up to the end of his life until he reaches a conclusion. And then another group is not satisfied with the introductory discipline. They, specul they speculate and think deeply about the knowledge in a discursive and an analytical way. They, nevertheless, ignore the practical faculty and the necessity of refinement of characters or tahzib akhlaq. So he's talking about the philosophers, those who only you know, entangle in uh, theoretical philosophy and not in practical mysticism. Uh, it is of utmost importance for Bahari and the Sufi order to which he belongs to establish a religious study in the Shia seminary at House of Elmiya, which does not exclude, exclude the spiritual victory. It is not only theoretical speculation that should take place in the seminary, but rather amal or practice, which must form an integral part of the seminary's curriculum. The same attitude exists in Bida Body's writing. As I repeat again, Bida Abadi is, is a master in uh, Zahabi or the well known figure. For instance, in his letter to, I mean, Bida Abadi, in his letter to one of his disciples, refers to the study of Ulum al Rasmi or uh, official sciences, whether it is language, hadith, or even Quranic exegesis, or even philosophy, as not moving one toward perfection. Next. Uh, both transmitted and intellectual sciences, according to him, have no impact except causing distance from the final goal. He then explains that the only way to eternal salvation is nothing other than full agreement in expression, power, action, fail, and the state hall with the prophet. This is in full agreement with this Islamic Sufi tradition. Bidabadi, moreover, refers to a prophetic hadith in uh, which prophet states that the shariat is my word, al-wali, and the tariqah is my action, al-wali, and the haqiqah, or reality, is my status, or al-wali. Next. So, in Bahari's view, if there is no engagement, with the Sufi past, with the practical reform. The official curriculum of Hazrat al Ilmiya would be, you know, something like, uh, or has no difference from a secular study of religious religion or civil law. But putting in Shirazi, Bida Badi, Nuri, Mullah Sandra, and others, people like them, like him, share the same notion. <clears throat> Sorry. Considering the broader meaning of fiqh, the broader meaning of fiqh, so he says. Bahari and his predecessors argued that the Shi seminary needs more in, um, the Shi seminary stands more in need of the knowledge of the first real of Tawheed and spiritual perfection. They reach this conclusion because they maintain that the first order of revelation is to bring about in human being change to elevate them and to facilitate the soul's transcendence in its return to the eternal abode. So Bahari's approach is similar to those who walk in the same path as that of Sayyid Haider Amuli. Ibn Mi'mar and many others in the history of Shia Islam. And the Maktabi Ma'rifatun Nafs is the is a recent example of this approach within the Shia seminary. Their most vigorous opponents, however, are the followers of the Maktabi Tafkik or the school of separation and other traditionalists within the Shia seminary. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'm going to conclusion.
Uh, Sheikh Mohammed Bahari was a faqi and a member of Exot Exoteric Order in the Shia Seminary of Najaf in the 19th century. He was a disciple of Akhund Mullah Hussain Wali Shamandi Ahmadani, who, uh, through Sayyid Ali Shushkari, was connected to Sajuddin Kashif Desfuli, and Desfuli as among the well known Zahabi Sheikhs of, the brand, of a branch that was called Zahabiya Kashifiya. We know that the Zahabiya order originated in um, Asia Minor as Kubrabiya and connected and continued as a Shia order and called as Zahabiya. The current form in the Shia seminary, however, is not referred to as Zahabiya, though it originates from the teachings of Qutbuddin, Nairizi, and Bidawadi, among the others. Most, uh, some have tried to conceal the Sufi origin of this order, confronting hostility toward the Sufi past in the seminary. Bahari applies common religious terminology to argue that the goal of Sufism is not but the goal of religion itself. Members of the Maktab e Ma'rifat al Nafs, the, um, the, 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 the order that we talk about, that Bahari belongs to, just as philosophers and other Sufis carefully try to reconcile between fiqh and the Sufi past by ascending uh, from the minor fiqh, fiqh asghar, to the greater fiqh, fiqh akbar, which is seen in the Bahari's pattern. That is why Bahari draw a progressive relationship between fiqh and amal, between amal and the refinement of Character, character or tahzib akhlaq, and between akhlaq and tawheed, the assertion of God's unity. These are the steps one should, one should ascend in order to reach to the first real or tawheed. Next. Masters of this order try to establish their interpretation of religion and revelation and faith in the Shia seminary by recruiting or initiating mostly qualified individuals from those who had already studied Islamic sciences or in religious terms, they were in the level of Ijtihad, PhD in house in religious sciences. Despite what the official curriculum of the House of El Emir offered, they struggle to suggest that they, uh, they struggle to suggest what they identified as a more authentic method of understanding the relation by paying attention to both, uh, both to the esoteric or botany and the rational or philosophical dimensions of Islamic revelation without ignoring the practical necessities of fiqh. They, however, encounter vigorous opposition from the esoteric scholars, both in the past and, and present, nevertheless, their school is still an ongoing and living tradition within the Shia seminary. Bahari and his masters should be placed among those scholars who genuinely believe and practice the Shia Sufi interrelation in the Shia seminary. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the point that I finish my talk, and I thank you for your listening. <laughs>